This video is for entertainment and educational purposes only. This video is brought to you by First Detachment Nutrition. Battle tested, expert formulated. Use discount code AB10 at checkout for 10% off. Hey guys, Big Paul here today and we are going to talk about building safer cycles. This is going to be a long one. I'm going to dig into some things. I'm going to talk about risk and how to consider risk when you're building your cycles. And we are going to talk about some of the safer use models that are out there now that are being promoted by people like Victor Black and John Jewett and Dr. Todd Lee. Other people out there are doing the same type of thing. I'm going to give you my take on it how I think about the safer use models and how they can be deployed and used in your cycle construction. And we're going to dig into all that in just one second. So when we think about safer use models, most people are going to use steroids regardless of what anybody tells them to do. And I wish when I was younger that I had somebody who'd been around the block to tell me what to do, what to avoid, to keep from f***ing myself up. It would have been helpful. There, there wasn't a lot of knowledge around when I was younger about how to use PEDs safer. Hell, a lot of times we didn't even know the difference between the different steroids. We just, you know, we heard steroid and we took a steroid. We didn't know what it did or how it affected our body. So we just jammed everything in or whatever we could get our hands on. It's a terrible way to do things. And we have more knowledge at our hands these days with the internet. That also can be a curse too because there's so much bad information out there. And so... Here's the thing. Most of us are recreational bodybuilders or just gym bros. So we want to lower our risk. It's not worth taking the risk just to be a gym bro. And there are times that you need to push down the gas pedal. We'll, we'll talk about that. But you need a long-term sustainable approach. We need to talk about reducing toxic drug load over a period of time. Androgens, when you think about it, are the most most often the most toxic substance that we're putting in exogenous androgens putting in our bodies and people overdo the exogenous androgen use uh, ways that we can reduce risk is to leverage multiple pathways and then we don't have to use as much androgens synthetic androgens so i know a lot of times people get freaked out by things like metformin and using insulin and using growth hormone and stuff like that. But when we put these things in intelligently, you can actually lower the amount of exogenous androgens that you're using and reduce your risk profile and leverage multiple growth pathways. So one of the things I like to talk about and I have other videos up about it is understanding toxicity of substances. The poison is in the dose, okay? And the differential between a therapeutic dose and a toxic dose varies from compound to compound. Water can kill you. It seems like a very benign substance, water, but you hear of marathon runners coming out of a marathon and drinking too much water and having an electrolyte balance and they kill themselves. They have a heart attack. So even the most benign thing in enough quantity can kill you. So we have to consider that with compound choice. The difference between a toxic dose and a therapeutic dose is something that we need to consider. Something that comes to mind off the top of my head would be DNP. And why DNP is so risky is that the difference between a, tox or a therapeutic dose and a lethal dose is so small. The margin of error is very, very slim. You see it with recreational drugs, you know, things like opioids and things like that. Another thing to consider is the duration of exposure. That also plays a factor into it. It's so it's the dose and duration to, to exposure. So having a cigar, smoking a cigar with your friends once a year or on your birthday or whatever is probably not going to cause you to have lung cancer. But smoking a cigar every day for the rest of your life might 
Smoking five cigars every day for the rest of your life is going to increase that profile even more. I like to use the alcohol analogy when it comes to PEDs. It's the whole wine versus moonshine argument that I use. They, you know, so one glass of wine is definitely not equal to a glass of moonshine. Moon, the moonshine is extremely more powerful and extremely more toxic. And we think about it in PED terms, something, something fairly innocuous like testosterone, you can run at high doses without much risk. I mean, lower risk than, like say, a thousand milligrams of testosterone does not carry the same risk profile as running a thousand milligrams of halotestin, for example. So that is something to consider too. So we think about think about it in terms of alcohol. You could probably drink a glass of wine every day for the rest of your life and just be fine. Same thing with testosterone. You could run TRT doses or slightly above TRT doses the rest of your life and probably be fine. You could probably run low dose primobol in, in there with that and you know still keep your keep your risk profile pretty pretty low but if you're jamming in a thousand milligrams of tran every week or blasting out 100 milligrams or 150 milligrams of anadrol every day for years on end you're vastly increasing your risk profile so evaluating risk when to take risk uh it's the whole risk versus benefit <laughs> analysis you know, what are your goals? If you're just trying to look good, if you're just trying to get a little bit bigger, if you're just trying to lose a little bit of fat, are you trying to compete locally? Are you trying to compete in the Mr. Olympia? Are you trying to be a professional athlete? And the tolerance for risk increase as those goals go up and as you get closer to those goals. So for example, if you're just a regular gym bro, why would you run the same compounds as a person who's trying to vie for the Mr. Olympia title that's already at the professional level? There, there's no need for it. Really, your benefit from taking that risk is not worth it. So you think about a an Olympia competitor, they have potentially a half a million dollars in prize money online or whatever it is now and big contracts so you're talking about millions of dollars in money that is potentially on the line or if you're trying to become a professional athlete and you're on the verge of doing so and you have a big financial reward then maybe depending on what your objectives are and how you think about things it might be worth taking a risk if you're just trying to compete in the mr des moines iowa show then your risk profile is a lot lower it's not worth taking as big of a chance now this is individual each person has to evaluate what their their risk uh, tolerance is so you think about it uh you, you know and there's things you can do to reduce the risk so you think about it in terms of riding motorcycles i i've ridden motorcycles my whole life i, I enjoy riding motorcycles I, I don't now because i have children and once again, this is a risk tolerance evaluation. I don't want to take the risk of dying in a motorcycle accident uh, because I have, I'm a single parent and I have kids. The same reason why I run safer compounds when I'm doing a cycle. So for motorcycle versus street racing an, a, the analogy, if you're a professional MotoGP rider, you're going to take some chances going around the track to win that race and probably going 160 180 miles an hour or whatever it is if you're just driving from here to work why would you take that risk there's no reason to take that risk there's no benefit for taking that risk whereas the guy that's on the track there is some benefit for for that risk also the guy that's on the track is further advanced in his skill set with riding and also has the safety equipment and the knowledge to keep himself safer when taking more risk. It's the same thing with a professional bodybuilder. A professional bodybuilder is more advanced and has more knowledge about these compounds than you do and is at a different point in their journey than you are. If you're just beginning, there's no reason to run the type of compounds that a professional bodybuilder would be running. So the things that we need to avoid, we don't wanna die young, and we need to think about the things that kill bodybuilders. Chronically, over the long term of years of exposure to PEDs, 
You know, we're talking about probably decades of exposure. Things that generally kill bodybuilders are strokes, heart attacks, um, arterial blockages, heart failure, kidney disease. Most of the stuff is cardiovascular related. The factors that cause these things are high blood pressure, uh, polycythemia, and lipid skewing. These are all things that are within our control, things that we can help mitigate through things like keeping our diet cleaner, choosing better compounds, keeping doses lower, using things like an ARB or an ACE inhibitor to lower our blood pressure to mitigate risk, using things like a uh, statin or ezetimibe to lower our to lower our lipids, to keep our lipids in check, doing cardio, stuff like that. Um, acutely, so you think about what kills bodybuilders in an instant. Um, it could be, uh, typically, the most that when you see bodybuilders just fall over without warning, it's at the end of contest prep. And it's usually related to either some sort of clotting issue or uh, related to a heart arrhythmia thrown from being um, dehydrated and having an electrolyte balance. Most often from diuretic use. That's usually what kills bodybuilders right at the end of contest prep. So one of the things that we can do to lower risk is to leverage multiple pathways when we're building out our cycles. So we have the androgen receptor. And most guys just focus on hitting the androgen receptor as hard as they possibly can. They don't use anything else. They don't understand that there are multiple pathways to stimulate growth. So, you know, we're usually doing that with uh, test in SARMs and steroidal SARMs. So they're just bludgeoning the androgen receptor. Uh, the IGF-1 pathway, that's another way. Uh, nutrient uptake is another way that we can leverage growth. You know, things like you know, increasing insulin production, increasing insulin sensitivity, improving digestion. You know, th those are things that we can use to leverage more efficient nutrient uptake. Uh, nutrient supply. This is another one that a lot of people don't consider when they're trying to add size in bodybuilding. The quality of your diet and the amount of food that you're eating plays a factor into it too. I can't tell you how many guys I've seen that they come to me that uh, won't pound food but they're shaking a shit ton of gear. They're taking grams of gear and they're not growing and they don't know why they're not growing and it has nothing to do with the gear. It's that they're not actually fueling the body with what it needs to grow. Uh, metabolism, having your metabolism optimized. Myostatin in inhibition, you know, through things like growth hormone and telmisartan. Um, and then the estrogen uh, pathway as well is also another way of leveraging growth. And most people only consider the androgen receptor in using exogenous androgens and anabolics. So when choosing our compounds, the stuff that we need to consider when we're picking our PEDs that we want to use, was it approved for human use? Uh, why, why, this just, something that, that, that makes me scratch my head a lot of times is, why it seems like newbies are obsessed with things like DHB and mint and yada, yada, yada. All of these exotic compounds that were never approved for human use and have no track record, no research, never passed clinical trials. And they really aren't any better than using a regular <laughs> approved for human use anabolic. So guys will use stuff that we have no proven track record of safe use with in we use that over something like primabolin or testosterone or nandrolone there, there's a bunch of other choices uh ha thorough clinical studies we want stuff that has been thoroughly studied uh, and that we have metadata on a long track record of human use in a known risk profile when we're taking it you know trend we know it's been around for a long time we know what the risks are associated with trend. We have a pretty good idea. And, you know, this is another thing, too, that I, I see with bros all the time is that they mistake more side effects in feeling like shit with it being a better compound for producing growth. I, I don't know why. It's, you know, an example I can give you would be the obsession with D-ball. People, some for some reason, think because they get bloated up, their blood pressure goes through the roof, they look... <laughs> They look like a red balloon that some, for some reason that D-Ball is better than the other choices that are there. So the compounds that I would consider in the safer use column, 
First and foremost, on the top of that pyramid is testosterone. Testosterone is the base of any performance enhancing cycle that you're going to build. So why not start off with testosterone? Masteron uh, has a proven track record and was approved for human use past clinical trials. Primabolin, the same for Primabolin. Nandrolone is another one, although some people have problems tolerating Nandrolone. Uh, we know what Nandrolone does. We know that it was approved for human use. We, we know what the clinical use for Nandrolone was, um, but some, in some people, Nandrolone causes anxiety and impotence issues. So it's something to be aware of. Anivar is another compound that I would consider in the safer use column with an asterisk next to it. Anivar does seem to crush HDL in long-term use that I've seen, but if you keep the doses low, Anovar is relatively safe. Proviron, Metformin, I don't know why guys are terrified of Metformin. I get these people all the time, they think Metformin, they take Metformin, they're not going to grow. There's a study that everybody likes to reference about IGF-1 suppression with Metformin, but if you look at the study, it was done on non-enhanced people who did not lift weights, and that does not translate to our cohort. <laughs> so if you're enhanced, you're taking insulin, GH, uh, exogenous uh, androgens, and anabolics, you probably are not going to have suppressed IGF-1 production from metformin. HGH is another one. Uh, and I put caffeine in here. People don't consider caffeine a performance-enhancing drug, but it certainly is. It has kept millions of workers at their desk and alert and focused on the work for decades. All of these are relatively safe. You're, if you screw up your dose of testosterone and take twice as much, even three times as much, even four times as much, you're not gonna fall over dead that day. So um, these are the ones I would consider in the safer use column. The compounds that I would consider in the use with caution column and what i mean by this are ones that have a higher risk profile but there is a compelling reason to use them beyond that warrants taking that risk so something like trembolone we know the risks that are associated with trembolone and it probably should not be run year round that is a really bad idea but trembolone does some very unique things that other compounds do not do with glucocorticoid suppression and body composition and feed efficiency that we can leverage on contest prep and in caloric type phases in our diet that we can use to our advantage. So Tren might be worth the risk in a short term to leverage certain benefits. Anadrol would be another one. Anadrol uh, has unique effects when it comes to force production. And Anadrol might warrant use if you are a strength athlete trying to peak for a strength competition, but it's a very limited use. Winstraw on contest prep. Halo would be another one for force production and or contest prep. Insulin. Insulin's another one that I think has been lumped into the lumped into the it's going to kill you if you even look at it column unnecessarily. I'm not saying that insulin does not carry risk. But I think bodybuilders often overlook it because of the, the lore that goes along with it, that if you look at insulin, you're going to drop over dead. I mean, the insulin has been around forever, decades, and one of the most widely used drugs, well-studied drugs in the world, that has a known risk profile. And if you're careful with it and you can do math and you are measuring and weighing your foods, you can use insulin with pretty high safety and with efficacy and insulin is a compound that is compelling to use because it you can actually lower the amount of exogenous androgens or other drugs that you're using that might be riskier long term usually i'd say start off with lantus and then move to the rapid acting insulins and there's even a compelling argument that insulin using something like lantus prophylactically may even be beneficial long run and save a bodybuilder from having type 2 diabetes down the road. And one of the issues that we run into with bodybuilders for a long time is jamming tons of food over decades while using growth hormone and becoming insulin resistant and your body keeps cranking out more and more insulin and you rag out your beta cells in your pancreas 
and your insulin endogenous insulin production is degraded and you have this vicious cycle of insulin resistance and overproduction of natural insulin insulin and then you just burn out your fucking pancreas and you end up becoming a type 2 diabetic if you were to use something like metformin along with your insulin you a basal insulin like lantus you may even reduce risk long term but insulin does carry the acute risk of death if you fuck up your calculations with it or you don't eat carbs you can die so i have it in the use with caution column here igf1 is another one it is in the use with caution column because there is a correlation between igf1 and cancer uh, clenbuterol is relatively safe at moderate doses. It is a prescription drug overseas used to treat asthma, from what I recall. So we have a long track record on clenbuterol, and we know that it's relatively safe. Long-term use of it at higher doses probably carries some risk. Same thing with ephedrine. Uh, T3 and T4 can be used with relative safety in bodybuilding, but they should be used judiciously at certain points in your journey. Equipoise, is, I put that over here. I have used quite a bit of equipoise in the past. I am sort of leaning away from it now. There is some evidence that equipoise may be kidney toxic. It's not definitive, but equipoise was never approved for human use. It was, it was a veterinary uh, pharmaceutical. Uh, so we just don't know. You know, you might be fine on equipoise long term. You might not be, but there are some studies. Now, granted, they were done on animals and they weren't really relative to our cohort. But there is some evidence that equipoise might be kidney toxic. So the things that you want to avoid completely. And the, here's the here's the thing that we have to consider with the stuff that we want to avoid completely. Does it do anything better than something else that warrants taking the risk of using it? Does it do something unique that you can't accomplish with something else? So, mint, DHB, things like that. I just lump it all, all the exotic anabolics. I lump in here because we don't have any long-term use studies on this. We don't know what the long-term consequences are of using them. And they were not designed for human use. And we don't know what's going to happen. And there's not a real compelling reason to use them because other anabolics, things like primobolin and testosterone and nandrolone, work just as well. <laughs> you know, there's only so much muscle protein synthesis you can generate in a given amount of time. So it seems like why not use the safer compounds and push the doses on those higher than f around with stuff we just don't know about? SARMs are another one. Everybody that's tiptoeing into the PED world wants to start off with SARMs. And you have to remember that SARMs were rejects from the pharmaceutical companies. They literally threw them in the trash, either because they didn't work that well or... They were concerned about the safety profile or they didn't do what they wanted them to do. All right. So why would you use a SARM when you when you can use a steroidal SARM like primobolin or nandrolone that actually works and we know what it does and it was approved for human use? I just don't understand why people play the f***ing SARM game. I, I just don't get it. They are not safer than using something like Nandrolone or Primobolin. They don't work as well as something like Nandrolone or Primobolin, but yet bros seem to think that it is a safer way and that they're still natty when they use them. A SARM is a SARM. <laughs> they are just crappier versions of the steroidal SARMs that we already have that we know that work. So why would you use them? Uh, D-ball is another one. I love to hate on D-ball. I know some people can tolerate D-ball well, but a lot of people don't. And once again, this is another argument. Does D-ball do anything uniquely well that we cannot accomplish with another safer compound? The answer is no. <laughs> so D-ball is the steroid that I've seen the most side effects pile up with from people you know, I talked about it earlier, but high blood pressure. I've seen people with crazy high blood pressure on D-ball. 
bloating, gynecomastia. I just don't understand why you would use it when you could do something. I mean, Anovar is infinitely better than D-Ball. Diuretics. I put diuretics over here. I would, I would avoid diuretics completely. You don't even really need them on contest prep if you're in shape. And the people that you've seen that have been that have been falling over dead lately, it's mostly from diuretic use going into the show. You're already in a situation where your blood is thickened from using exogenous anabolics. And you're in a situation where you're already dehydrated because of water restriction and you're already depleted. And then you throw diuretics on top of it. That is a recipe for killing yourself. So how to build a safer cycle? Test base. I mean, we, I, I, I see guys talk about, you know, starting off with Sarms and starting off with Anivar and whatever, whatever the case m might be. Why would you not start off with testosterone? Testosterone is the base of every cycle that every bodybuilder runs forever. So why wouldn't you want to start off with that one and see how you tolerate it? You may not like it. You may say, F this, I don't want to do this ever again. So why wouldn't you just start off with testosterone? We know that testosterone is relatively safe. Uh, we know what testosterone does. We know what the side effects are. We know how to treat those side effects. And like I said, it's the base of every cycle that any physique athlete is going to use. So why not start off with testosterone? The next compound that you would probably choose if you're building on a cycle would be an anabolic. And that's used to supplement the testosterone. We are going to take the testosterone doses up as high as we can tolerate without an AI. Sometimes those doses can go higher with an additional uh, anabolic that brings down uh, estradiol as well or works as an aromatase inhibitor, something like Masteron or Primavolin. So you can actually work your testosterone dose up higher without an AI with the use of something like Primavolin alongside of it. You can even throw a third anabolic in there if you want. HGH is another thing to consider. HGH has a long track record of use. We know what it does. We know what the risks are. We know that it's relatively safe if you keep the doses moderate. We know that the biggest risk with HGH are acromegaly and insulin resistance and carpal tunnel, things like that. So if you keep the doses lower, you manage your, your insulin resistance with things like metformin or berberine. And you keep, or maybe you take time off of the GH, you run it something like a five on, two off, you keep your diet tight, you can run GH with relative safety. And it is a very, very effective compound to add to your cycle. Leveraging nutrient uptake with things like berberine and metformin, uh, insulin sensitizers, and using insulin to help leverage more efficient nutrient uptake. Fat burners are selectively used in a, in a fat loss phase. You don't want to be running them year round, but you pick and choose times when you're going to leverage them. Things like clen, yohimbine, caffeine. They're all very effective. Uh, thyroid. There are times that we may need to modulate our thyroid and we do it intelligently with things like T3 and T4. We let the blood work dictate when we need to do that. In the toxic compounds, if we are going to run to compounds that are more toxic, like Tren or Anadrol, there better be a compelling reason to do so. I see a lot of times in the off season where guys want to throw in toxic things like Tren and Anadrol and DHB and Mint and whatever. The, the list goes on and on and on and on. When really the primary goal in the off season is to generate muscle protein synthesis, accumulate new tissue, and these compounds don't really provide any additional benefit to that, that we can't leverage out of a safer, less toxic compound. So once again, you know, you're probably safer off running Primabolin at a higher dose or Nandrolone at a much higher dose and staying away from the A-bombs 
and the mint and the DHB and yada, yada, yada. All right, folks, that's all I've got for you today. I want to give a shout out to my sponsor, First Detachment Nutrition. Check out their supplements. They are made by the man himself, formulated by Justin Harris. They're fantastic. Please go check them out. They are supporting my channel. They're helping me do this, pay for this stuff. Uh, so I would appreciate it if you check them out. Discount code is AB10 and the link is in the profile below. I really appreciate all of you guys watching. Take care. For coaching or consultations, head over to www.anabolicbodybuilding.com to book your spot today. I can help you with optimizing hormones, fat loss, muscle gain, physique, athletic performance, nutrition, and health. For more information, shoot me an email at bigp3rd at gmail.com.